Thanks, thanks for me as well, for all of you who are taking time out of your day to be here. I'm really excited about the group of folks I'm sitting here with as we explore some of the ways you might bridge some of the divides that exist in our, um, in our, communi in our communities, in our nation, in our world. Um, I think it's very cool that the, the, the mix of folks we have here, uh, broadcast journalists based in DC, uh, print journalist based in Denver, academic researcher who is based in Philadelphia but travels around a lot talking to people. It should be a cool mix. Let me just tell you a little bit about each of them and then I'll pose um, the first question to them. One of Summers um, is at the um, fondly aforementioned CNN um, and covers politics. If you've been following the stories in the VA over the last month to six weeks, you've seen her name a lot. Um, it turned out to be one of her beats, and so even this morning she was breaking a story on, on um, life in the White House Physician's Office. And so um, it's good to have her. She is a graduate of University of Missouri. You can read other things in her um, biography in the program, but it's probably worth noting she also is a competitive pinball player and craft beer nerd. <laughs> so you're in the right place. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Andrea Wenzel is an assistant professor at Temple University. Again, there's some details of her bio in the booklet, but it's worth noting her research focuses on how residents of changing multi-ethnic communities negotiate the difference through media, culture, and everyday interaction. She leads projects on local news, political polarization, rural urban divides, digital and offline community engagement. She's worked on community-based um, solutions journalism, um, and in, then also looking at um, initiatives that combine food and dialogue about racial justice. And I spent quite a bit of time earlier traveling around the world teaching journalism and public radio, and it's great to have you with us, Andrea. And Nick Penzlestadler, investigative reporter for USA Today, based in Denver, um, grew up in Wisconsin, UW-Madison grad. Um, and what's not in the program is that he'll be one of those people who gets honored for really doing cool things in the first 10 years after graduation. So good to have all of you with us. The, the title of the panel is Bridging Gaps with Ethical Journalism. And I, I want to start with that so we don't lose the, the focus. If each, if each of you could just say a few words about you know, what role does ethics play in bridging the gaps in our world? I don't know who wants to jump in first on that, but. Uh, well, I can talk a little bit Nick. about our, our recent projects. I mean, I'm on a projects team that works for months on these, you know, kind of sprawling investigations. And I think one of our mantras has been to uh, show people and not tell people and prove things out before we present them. Um, so I think part of my role on our investigative team is to kind of cut through some of these divides and prove things out and write with authority and show people um, some of these truths. Andrew, as you've been out talking to people, do, they, do questions of ethics come up when you're talking to them? I don't think people frame them in terms of ethics necessarily, but um, I've been talking to a lot of people who don't have a whole lot of trust in media <laughs> for different reasons. Um, and they talk about practices that I think are related to ethics. So things like thinking about how you're sourcing information, thinking about the represent, how you're representing people when you're doing that, um, not just in terms of you know, talking about getting your facts right, but talking about showing respect to the people you're covering um, and kind of getting into some challenges of things like parachute journalism and stuff like that along the way. Also connecting to the what came up in the previous discussion about negativity um, and kind of a desire for, you know, can you show us things in our communities that are not only just the bad stuff? Um, can you not, you know, question how you decide what's newsworthy in that respect? So. Thoughts? Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that's been really interesting, similar to what Andrea said, is that a lot of what I encounter is the negativity side. And I spend a lot of time when I'm talking to sources doing a lot of education on what the practical side of journalism looks like. I think on one hand, people look at a finished story that we may do, and my work tends to be shorter to medium term investigative stories. And they don't see the weeks or days of legwork behind it. They don't necessarily, all of our stories we don't list. We've talked to X number of sources. Oftentimes, we can't be transparent about conversations we had that may not necessarily be on the record that have informed our journalism while they may not be quoted in stories. So I spend a lot of time trying to explain to people how we do the work that we do, because I think it's something that the general public often doesn't know a lot about, and I think can be really helpful to explain to people. So you've been in, immersed in the, the VA story um, over the last, and where where are places in working on the story you've encountered 
divides are clearly there. How have you negotiated that that terrain? Um, and are there ethical questions that have come up for you as you've been? I have to be a little bit careful here because, as you noted out, this is a story that we're still it's reporting. Alive. There's still a lot going on, so I can't maybe be as transparent as I would perhaps like to be because I've got a couple things in the hopper for later today. But um, <laughs> it's the news world, folks. <laughs> been a little bit of a busy week. Um, one of the things that I think has been interesting as we've been covering this story is countering someone's very public perception and the things you hear from people who are very in both this White House and previous administrations and the private perceptions of people who work alongside and under Dr. Jackson. So the story that Phil alluded to, my colleague MJ Lee and I just published this morning, talks about what it was like to work in the White House medical unit, which up until recently isn't a unit that people knew quite a lot about. It's a unit that cares for not just the president, but members of the White House staff, the vice president, even reporters who travel with the administration. And publicly, especially, um, we spoke to, I think, a half dozen Obama officials who were very surprised by some of the allegations that have come up about Rear Admiral Jackson's conduct while on the job and have said, you know, glowing things about him. They've been publicly, I know we've quoted David Axelrod, who has said he never saw anything of the sort. But privately, we spoke to five different sources within the medical unit who are Jackson's current and former colleagues who painted a very different picture of what it was like to work there. I think that's the biggest ethical gap of how you square those two realities when one person's experience with a public figure is quite different from a group of others and figuring out how to portray the most accurate um, depiction of a person's career. How have you tried to do that? What are the steps you've taken to try and, and balance those two perceptions that are out there? First thing is just to talk to as many people as possible over the span of time. We're talking about someone who has been a White House physician since 2006 is when he was named, so for more than a decade. So talking to as many people over the course of the span of career, I think, really helps, and talking to people at different levels, and to talking to people whose accounts come independently of one another. And I think that's been the biggest thing, is just spending as much time in field, so to speak, as we possibly can, and getting the most wide view, and to be accurate, uh, and to be as um, transparent as we possibly can about how we find our sources, and who those sources are, and to be as descriptive as possible. And so you'll see if it's a story you look at, we published it around 7 a.m. this morning, that we say that we our account was based on X number of people who spoke to us about his career, and we say that four people, for example, told us that they had concerns about um, the dispensing of medications, for example. So just being as specific to give the reader as much information as possible to draw their own judgments and conclusions. One of the things I've noticed in the stories in the last couple of years, that, that device of saying, we've talked to 30 people about this, we've talked to 20 people about this, four people. Being much more specific about the numbers of anonymous sources, because anonymous sources are one of the things I think we all grapple with, is how do we, people out there don't trust anonymous sources, and it seems to me that's the problem. Is, well, at least we'll do numbers. I think that's true, and I, I think that people have good reason to be anonymous sources and a lot of times, I mean, look, my preference as a journalist, I would love it if every single thing I could put in a story could be on the record all the time. But unfortunately, specifically in this story, a lot of the sources that are speaking out and that went to, um, for people who may not be as familiar, uh, John Tester, the Montana senator who is the top Democrat on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, compiled a two-page document of allegations about uh, Admiral Jackson's practices while serving as the uh, White House physician. It was compiled by, based on the accounts of 23 people who either currently work with him or previously worked for them. One of the sensitivities there is that the White House medical unit is staffed largely by people who are active duty military members. And a, a lot of those kind of people aren't people who are going to be able to come forward and speak to me on the record about what they're experiencing because, frankly, it could cost them their job. That's not something you do in the military. So as much as I'd love to have all of those anecdotes and all the things we've reported over the last few weeks on the record as someone who's spent a good deal of time covering veterans, a good deal of time co covering the military based on the structural limitations of the, the structure of the military, I shouldn't say limitations, that's highly unlikely. Sure. So, Nick, you were doing some of the reporting on um, President Trump's um, real estate and, and other financial transactions in the course of all this, where you were working much more with documentary evidence. And I know we've talked a little bit about the process you and the team at USA Today went through in looking at um, how, do we, how do we anticipate um, questions and how do we help make what we're doing transparent. It's, in some ways, it's easier because you're working off of documents, but there are challenges with that as well. Could you talk about that a yeah, little that's, bit? Yeah, that's kind of one of our 
key things, especially when you're working with a lot of editors, you know, they have a little of those probing questions and trying to undermine the story and anticipate. Or those nasty editors. Yeah, exactly. Um, so one of those questions was obviously putting these things in context. Um, and with Trump, it's so difficult because there aren't a lot of comparables. So, you know, in that case, we were looking at his business record and we had to look at other, um, you know, real estate moguls. When we were looking at lawsuits, for instance, we had to say, well, someone in his position who's been, you know, working for this this same structure, how many, how, what can we compare it to? Um, so we spent that extra week, you know, counting up lawsuits and counting up things that we can compare them to so we could put one line in the story, but it helped head off that criticism that we knew was going to come from people who constantly would say, you know, you've done this three month investigation, but of course he has a lot of lawsuits, but we could say yes, but you know, compared to peers, he's still an outlier and we could show that with our work. So that's interesting, the amount of time you put for one line in a story, which I think is often, you know, readers don't recognize all of that. Is there, is there ways you told your readers about some of the work that went into the story beyond just there was that line? Yeah, this? I mean, we, I think a couple of our stories in this vein have come with those either side stories of how we did it or the nerd box or, you know, here's our methodology, here's how we went after it, and you can check a lot of it because it's public. Um, and we tried to source a lot of it from you know deed records and public transactions and then post a lot of them when we had them for key source documents. And what was the reactions you got from, I mean, apart, certainly there'd be some reactions from political people who are on either side of the equation, but from did readers react and say, I don't believe this, or um, boy, thanks for giving us this detail. I guess sort of that, the overarching question, how does this make a difference in terms of reader trust in what we do? Right, I think I think that's the hard part. I mean, you have to get past the so what, and a lot of times, um, especially in the campaign reporting, there's so much reporting and there was so much coming at people that you had to break through. And I think with our real estate series and um, recently our golf course coverage, we did that because it, it was very tangible, um, wasn't sourced to people from his past or from people who may have known him. It was you know, current and it was also based on, on things you could verify and look at with your own eyes. Um, but I still think there was that criticism of the kind of so what, um, which is a challenge for anybody um, where you have to explain why you know this is so outside the norm and you have to compare it to past presidents, you have to compare it to practices and, and norms that are, are being broken kind of all over the place. So, Andrea, you've been spending a lot of time listening to um, citizens and, and their perceptions on the media. And can you describe a little bit first, you know, what the project is you've been working on, but then more importantly, what have, what have you been hearing? Sure. Um, so I've been working on two main projects, one in rural Kentucky and then one in Philadelphia and a neighborhood in Philly and a suburb in Philly. Um, and Sorry. <laughs> you have the Justin Gillis honorary mic there. Uh, so. <laughs> excellent. I'm, I feel honored, and I'm sorry about the. I'll try to. I used to do radio, so I should be able. I should be better at this. Um, but uh, yeah. So in Kentucky, what we've been doing is we wanted to think about can we look at this issue of political polarization and see what it looks like at the local level. So even if you have an area where it's mostly Republican, there it's not not that everyone there is Republican. There are these divisions in communities, and so how does that play out in people's lives? And so we, we set up a process where we did a series of re a research study where we did focus groups and had people keep diaries of how they use stories and then did interviews. And then we brought together journalists, um, residents, and different community stakeholders and had a workshop and invited them, okay, here's what we found. What would you like to do about it? Are there things that we can do to address some of the concerns that were raised around things like too much negativity in coverage, um, a lack of coverage of community issues from a solutions-oriented angle? You know, what can we do to kind of reframe that and shift the narrative from you know who is to blame for what's wrong to what can be done about it? And so they came up with a series of ideas, and now they're piloting those. Um, so right. So what now, were some of the ideas? Yeah. So when um, we're collaborating with a hyperlocal. Um, site called the Ohio County Monitor. Um, it's basically two guys who cover an entire county. Um, and they, they had an idea for doing projects that would kind of reinvent community traditions, two ones in particular. One, this idea of having society columnists. So 
Back in the day, there'd be somebody who writes about the, the comings and goings of their, of their small area, you know, some sort of very pre-Facebook updates on so-and-so had a baby, so-and-so had a guest from out of town. Um, and this sort of information, while it might seem trivial, was really the way people found out what was happening. You know, if they found out that someone's sick and needs help or, you know, this issue needs to be addressed. And so they're reimagining this as community contributors where they invite residents to participate in the process of telling their own stories and, and doing, you know, it also helps them to cover a wide geographic area. Um, they're doing that and they're doing the thing they call the liar's table tour um, where they go around, I don't know, I don't think in Wisconsin they're called liar's tables, but I think the f concept is familiar where you go to a small area, you go into a McDonald's or a diner or something and there's a table of generally older white men sitting around as they would say, solving the world's problems, um, and just you know sharing. It. But the thing is, in these areas of Kentucky, these are the only public square that's left. There's not other public spaces for people to gather. And so, this, if you want to know what's going on, it's how you find out what's going on in your community. Um, and so, the hyperlocal outlet is trying to connect to these liars' tables by going around. Um, talking with them, and then trying to make a connection between the people who probably would not feel comfortable in these spaces um, and feel comfortable dropping into these liars tables to let them know what information is circulating and then also to connect to these guys who are not online. Um, so they're trying to like address some of these things in different ways. And I won't get into the Philly stuff because that's just, we just did our research in our workshop and we're now kind of trying to figure out what projects to do. but. We're looking at how you can take this process and look at it in different places to connect to communities. So one of the, for folks from the Wisconsin area who are familiar with Kathy Kramer's work in, in doing, in, they weren't called liars tables, but they were liars tables. Yeah. This could be the liars table too up here. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but Kathy went to all these places where people gathered and talked and, and she was looking at it particularly from the politics, her book's Politics of Resentment, but it's the similar process. and and. She was doing it as an academic, and it's part of what you're saying is journalists ought to be hanging out in some of these places. And yeah, and I think there's a um, some of you might have heard of this project called the Listening Post. Um, the, there's this thing called the Listening Post Collective. They have an online resource, but they have done work in New Orleans and New Jersey and Nebraska and a number of different places around the U.S. Um, where they try to look at, you know, where are people in their communities gathering and how can we connect with them? And so they often set up like a physical recording booth or a recording s s microphone. They do like sculptures sometimes, all kinds of interesting things. But basically the idea is like understand where people gather naturally and try to go and meet them where they're at um, and use that as an opportunity to crowdsource ideas, um, but also to kind of start dialogue and try to start two-way conversations between people that you might not be reaching as part of your s standard audience already. So. so one of the journalism you're doing probably doesn't involve let's list people's babies that they're having and, <laughs> and such. I mean, it's a di you're, you're in a different world of journalism. Well, I was thinking about your life at Politico, you were there for a while, and yeah. how the, the playbook each day lists birthdays and weddings and births and comings and goings. It's an interesting, it, it, it's directed at a very specific community. It's the inside the bubble community. Um, but there is a sense of the personal connections that are being made. I've, I pre, in a previous life, I wrote a morning newsletter for Politico that covered defense, national security, and foreign policy issues. And while we may not be having the same kind of conversations as Andrew is talking about, there is kind of this need to serve this very insular insider audience and to get them. I, the newsletter I wrote went out at 5 o'clock every morning, 5, 5.30 a.m. So getting into their inboxes early, building community around that subject matter, making them feel like they're part of the club and getting them information that they need to know to start their day. And I think that's, I've been a reporter in Washington for, I guess, nine years now. And I think that's one of the interesting things is that while... The, the topics are very different. Some of the same fundamentals of community-based journalism still exist even on the national political beat. Yeah. And, and, and so Nick, for you, I mean, you're again, you're writing for a national audience. Um, you're, you're doing investigative things. There's not that sort of, are there ways you feel you are connecting with people beyond just here's today's story, um, but that somehow people, are, readers are being engaged in what you're doing in some way? Are there, are there efforts being made in that direction? Yeah, I think there's both on the front end and on the the back end of that a little bit. Um, I think you see with investigative stuff that people aren't going to call you and tell you their secrets, and <laughs> until you um, gain trust and you know 
collect a, a group of sources, you're not going to have that kind of connection. And the, I mean, I think you have to learn to call people not when you need them um, and relationships. So I think that's definitely on the reporting side is it takes a long time to, to build up sources and trust. Um, and then I think on the audience side, because we have this weird, you know, hotel traveler audience, um, we end up getting these readers from all over the place that that find some interesting connection. Um, you know, we're writing about Trump's real estate, we're talking about condo buyers from Scottsdale. And, you know, I have a neighbor from Scottsdale call me and they want to talk about anonymous shell companies and who else is buying these and why does it matter? And um, so, yeah, I think our audience is, is so vast and all over the place that we end up having these really interesting conversations. Juana, how do you think about your audience? This is sort of the following on Sharon's question earlier, Justin, when you're doing this, how are you, who do you think you're talking to? Do you, do you cast, do you have a vision of a people or a group of people, or is it just you sitting there watching? Um, that's a great question, and I think for me and the topics that I cover, it really depends on the piece and what we're going after. I, I'm cognizant that a person sitting home here in Wisconsin and a person who works at the Pentagon in DC are gonna have very different needs or what they want from a story. So I think I really try to think about my stories on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally, if I had to describe the audience member, I think about it as someone who's generally curious about the world around them, who cares about democracy, and who's interested in getting the best version of a story that's in the public interest. But it really is, I think, a case-by-case -case basis. There are definitely some stories I write where, I, where an, an average news consumer may not care about it, but I think it's very important for Washington readers, and there are stories that I definitely write with a more general audience in mind. There were, there were two um, poll results that came out in the last two days that I found kind of interesting. And I don't, I don't, I'm guessing, I'm approximating the numbers because I didn't write these things down. But Quinnipiac had a poll yesterday about people's perceptions of the media, a, con a continuing question. And, and the real partisan divide around perceptions of the media were about, I think it was 48% of Republicans saw the media as a threat to the nation. Um, and, and the flip side on, on the Democratic I side. Wrote that down. 51% say that the news media is the enemy of the people, while 37% of Republican voters say the news media is an important part of democracy. Yeah. So, and, 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 and it's the mirror image yes. on, the, on the Democratic side. Second, second poll from Pew, um, looking at um, people perceiving how, um, is their side doing well, or, or, or are we doing well or not doing so well? And both liberals and conservatives think their side is losing. Whatever I care about, my side is losing. Your side is doing better. And, and, and these are really, really speak to the kind of the divides that um, is sort of the overarching theme of this conference. And it seems to me that it's part of the challenge we as journalists face in how do we tell a story. And I guess, uh, Andrea, I'm kind of leading to you with this part because you've been listening to folks not only in Kentucky and Philly, but in a, a lot of different projects you've done over the last several years. Do these mirror the kinds of things you hear from people and what's underneath that? I don't know if I can do that justice entirely, but... Um, <laughs> Not having seen the polls. But. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, one thing, certainly like a sense of mistrust is, is that reflects the conversations I've had, particularly as far as national news goes, um, a little bit better with local news. So I say there's a difference between how people see their local media yes. and the national. Um, and it, I can't say conclusively everywhere, but in the places that I've talked to people. That said, in areas, particularly in Philly, where I've been looking more recently, in communities that have never been covered fairly by local media and have a sense of feeling stigmatized by local media, that they only get covered for crime, things like that, then that's a different issue. That trust gap is not a new thing. It's been there. It's, not, it's, it's an old story. Um, and so, you know, that's local news doesn't necessarily fare better in that regard. Um, likewise, if you are in an area that's functionally a news desert in some suburban areas, um, there's a different kind of issue as far as local news goes. But in general, I would say there's more potential for um, shifting narratives in a more, how can we talk about shared community issues when you go to the local level? I think that's a much easier transition to make um, when you think about how can we look at rebuilding trust or building it from scratch in some cases. Um, I would say that there's a little bit more promise there. Nick, you want to jump in on this? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I 
especially coming from a, a local newsroom for for four years right out of college, I saw a lot of that mistrust on that on the local level. Um, and I also got a lot of criticism. I mean, I, I got criticism for focusing on um, watchdog journalism and accountability journalism. I, I think people misunderstand what the mission of that is, especially when they're the target of it. Um, I remember, you know, city hall officials just ragging on me saying, you know, when are you going to show some of our successes and why aren't you writing about this? And I would have it explain like that. That's not, I don't have that much time and that's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to, you know, hold your hand and, and, and show all of the successes to the city, um, especially when you've just hired four PR people to do that for you. Um, you know, I'm here to hold you accountable and to be the one person in the room asking probing questions. Um, and I still, I, I mean, I think that is true with national reporting too. I mean, we in our investigative role are advocates for people getting screwed like all the time. So showing people that we're here to help expose problems and try to solve them is, I think, how we get that trust back. Yeah. And actually, I mean, it's worth noting both both you and Juana worked in local media before you were on, on that national stage. You, you had the joy of covering Missouri politics, which yeah. is hardly anything ever happens in Missouri politics, I guess. Yeah, no shortage of news there. I think, Nick, I, to Nick's point, though, I think it's very difficult in this investigative reporter. Sometimes people, the most frequent thing I think I hear, and I'm sure you hear too, is you're always looking to find something wrong with the situation. And I try to push back and try to explain that it's not that we're looking for something wrong. It's that we're trying to expose information that's in the public interest. We're not just trying to paint people or institutions in a bad light. And sometimes I think that that our role and what our, what our goals are can get lost. A, a yep. pitch for, um, I mean, one thing that came up earlier was this idea of solutions journalism. And I think um, it's it's worth noting that that can be investigative journalism too, and that it's not just necessarily looking only at successes, that it's looking at a problem, but then looking at what our responses to that. And it's, it's kind of the idea of reframing the, the role of a journalist from, you know, if you have a responsibility not only to be a watchdog for what's going wrong, but also to be a you know, highlight what is being done about it and what could be done about it. Um, like that's part of a mission to, if you want people to be informed citizens. So I, I just wanted to kind of nudge a little bit that it's not a either or, it's not like a just looking, you know, the, the investigative stories can also be solutions oriented. And I think a lot of times that happens. I don't, I think that it's also kind of a term that is used now in a way that it's, it's not necessarily really a new thing. It's been around. It's just kind of a way of pushing the emphasis a little. Can you give a couple examples of solutions journalism? Because that was an area you've done some work in as well, of solutions journalism stories. Where, where How does that look? How does it play out? It looks very different depending. I mean, because it, it can be a real range. It can be everything from like an investigative story on, you know, someone who's a, an initiative that is something unexpectedly good is happening in education or an environmental issue or whatever issue. Um, or it can be... Um, something very local and very small and, and not necessarily like an in-depth investigation. Um, so it can really be, a, it's, it's more about an orientation than a, like a particular genre. Um, it can also, I think when it's done best, it's paired with engagement journalism and it's, it's informed, you know, that, that it's connecting up with communities as well. Um, I'm not really answering your question. It's giving a specific <laughs> example. Um, but I, I think, yeah, but if something comes, we can come back. I mean, I think one of the points you're making here is really there's a, a an array of things that fall under the umbrella of journalism. And there's the hard investigative pieces, yeah. um, which are really important in terms of defending the public's interest. Um, that doesn't negate the value of solutions journalism or engagement journalism or community journalism. All of these are pieces of journalism. And, you know, we've all um, dealt with, well, the media does this, and the media is not like a single sort of thing. Um, Juana, as you're dealing with folks in in DC, I mean, you've, you've been around that community for a long time, so you have developed a lot of sources. How, mu how much of it, how much of what you wind up doing is people calling, calling, tagging you, saying, hey, you ought to be looking at this. How much of it is, um, you're, you're, I mean, the VA thing, it's just, it's there. How much of it is something you stumble across in some way? How does all this fit together? Um, I get, I definitely get a lot of tips and on the specific VA story, I would say I probably get, I've probably gotten more than I would typically get, but that also has, happens to be the case that I covered the House and Senate VA committees when I worked at Politico, so it's kind of a known commodity and had spent some time in the space before. 
Um, I, as Nick kind of alluded to, I spend a lot of time calling people when I don't need them, just chatting with people that I know and asking them, hey, like, what's going on in your world that I, sh or how are things going for you? Or, oh, it, I saw that your kid won the spelling bee the other day. And just being really chatty and really curious, I don't spend a whole lot of time in the office, much to I'm sure my editor's dismay sometimes, but just spend a lot of time talking with interesting people that I've met over the years. I've got a story that I'm working on that's coming from a tip from a woman that I met at a hearing that I covered back in 2012. Mm. So just keeping a long, long list of sources. I keep way too many records of business cards that I get over the years, but I would say a lot of my stuff, especially on the more investigative end, just comes out of just frequent conversations and doing those kind of table touches, so to speak, with people that I've met over the years to find out what they're interested in or what's or what's irking them. Yeah, so Nick, how about you? Where, where do your stories come from? Not, you can name the sources if you want, but more generally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um, some of what we're doing now is top down and we're you know we're basically starting with a federal either data set or a collection of issues and trying to bring them to a local level um, but also I think we're finding that the better stuff usually is from the bubbling up um, where we find local issues that really are are emblematic of a national issue um, but my, I mean my day to day is really um, with those national data sets right now we're, we're probing um, the Heckam the reverse mortgage program and we have you know HUD's data but obviously those claims are down to one address with one elderly person um, working our way backwards and finding them and then convincing them to talk to us and tell us their stories so um, it's kind of a long process sure sure I'm uh, Justin Gillis has set a, a high standard for everyone to read all the comments on his stories. Um, but I guess I'm wondering for, for you all, do you, how much do you, do you look at comments that come back, both in comment sections or whatever form that takes, but also just people emailing you? How much in sort of post-story engagement do you let yourself have? There's a time limit in terms of... Well, I, I definitely get a lot of the initial, we have our Facebook system, so you have to be logged in, which I think has helped, um, at least so most people are real people. Um, and, I mean, once you get into the thousands, I think you start putting them into categories on what people are seizing on. Obviously, there are people who don't read the stories, um, but I think you start putting them in buckets on, okay, here's something we could have done better because everyone is, is talking about this part of the story, and either they're not clear or they're attacking it. Um, I think I don't read all the comments because you could just see the same thing over and over and you're like, okay, obviously either we made a mistake or this this is a flashpoint and people are discussing it. Um, and then I also get a lot of phone calls and emails when we have those big flashpoint stories um, and kind of have to go through them because some have tips that are worth following up on. Yeah, yeah. How about for you, Anna? How much? Um, I, I definitely, I would say I probably look at more of the feedback and engagement that I get on social, so on Twitter, Facebook, what have you, from people who are responding to the stories. I definitely, I, I definitely look and mine for tips and like, like Nick, look for where I, I could have been better. I don't let myself get too sucked into it though, just because literally in some of these stories where I'm either going on air reporting a story or we have a story on our website. You can be talking about thousands of comments and while some are going to be useful, others are just going to be fake news. And you just got to do, I think everyone has their own sorting process as to figuring out what's helpful and what's not. Yeah, yeah. And so, Andrea, and I'm not sure that this came up in your conversations with people, do, but people probably have some sense they can contact their local media if they have a complaint or story. Any sense of what do few, people feel they can be in touch with the national media at all? Or is it just, is it so far removed from their lives that they feel powerless? Um, I, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't come up a lot, to be honest, but I, I mean, it, the being in touch with local reporters did come up a lot. Um, but yeah, I think for a lot of folks, that takes a particular kind of energy that most people probably don't have. Mm -hmm. um, there was a sense from people, even when thinking about local, particularly in larger communities, um, that there are some of the same dynamics in some neighborhoods as far as parachute journalism as there are at the national level. And there was a sense that you know they only come in at a certain time, and that's the only time we see them. Um, and we'd like to be more involved in the process, not just at the end when the story comes out and commenting, but we'd like to be involved early on. We'd like to help be part of the conversation of what gets covered. We'd like to be part of the conversation on follow-up, 
not just you know after it goes out, but like after that happens, what what next? Can we mm -hmm. have a conversation and use this to push things forward? So there is an energy for being more involved in a process. You see more of that. Do you see newsrooms being more open to that? Yes, um, I feel like not necessarily across the board, <laughs> um, and that there's even in newsrooms where there are certain people, you know, key people really interested in questions of engagement, there's often cultural dynamics within the newsroom that are challenging. I mean, there's people who, they might be all revved up to do something, but their editor is not. Um, but there's certainly a growth of kind of a number of different organizations working on engagement, a number of different digital tools. Arkin, we have Ground Source, we have a number of other projects that are trying to make it easier for journalists to do that. Um, and and trying to also work with the editors and the systems to make that more accessible. So we're going to turn to questions from you in just a second, so be, be thinking. Um, but I'd just ask each of you if you could share a resource or two that you think might help the rest of us in thinking about the role journalism ethics can play in bridging divides, maybe a book, a podcast, a website, a movie, and whatever you found useful in your own thinking about this. I think some of the recent uh, kind of pop culture uh, dramatizations or documentary type newsroom books are really uh, interesting. So like there's a new Netflix series come up about the BuzzFeed reporting mm -hmm. process. Um, I think the new Showtime series, The Fourth Estate, spent a year at uh, the New York Times. I think that's going to be fascinating because I think people still don't understand um, both a daily cycle and then a project cycle on how you, you know, vet and verify and not put everything you hear into the paper. Uh, I mean, I think about how much ends up on the cutting room floor that people um, probably don't understand how it all works. So I think that, that'll help the general public understand how. Andrew, are there things you find really useful in thinking about this? Sure. Um, I say particularly for, for newsrooms that are interested in engaging more with publics and making that part of their ethical bent. Um, there's a number of really interesting projects going on right now that have websites that have resources. One of them is um, News Voices, which is run by Free Press, and they do work in New Jersey and North Carolina. Um, but they have a, like a guide and a toolkit on their website if you look up News Voices. Um, and then um, the Jefferson Center does a lot of work, particularly looking at questions of having conversations in communities around divisive issues. Um, and they have a number of interesting things. There's so many, though. so. Okay. Ilana, what, what's good for you? Um, so I was lucky enough at the end of last year to get to spend a week at the Pointer Institute down in Florida um, as a, a part of a program they had as a partnership with the National Association of Black Journalists. And one of the coolest things I think we did there is we spent actually, I want to say it was two, two and a half hours in a session about the frameworks of ethical journalism. And we were, I think this was in the height of all of the Me Too coverage and a lot of the coverage of sexual harassment and politics and across industry that the, the nation's really been grappling with. And we were just sitting through the frameworks of how to make those decisions, not about not just about covering those types of incidents, but also when they impact people in your newsroom. As you know, this is an issue that the press has been grappling with too. And while I know everybody can't go down to Florida and do that class, they actually have a free two hour version of that seminar on their website. And I was looking at it with a coworker that I was telling about it, and I think it's really useful and just helpful to kind of guide through how to make those decisions, not just for the stories that appear on the page or the website or on TV, but also as you think about decisions about personnel and staffing. And I think it would be something that's useful not just for journalism practitioners. Great, thank you. So we've got about 15 minutes for, for things you'd like to ask the folks on the panel. So um, wait for the mic to arrive, and um, anybody want to lead off? Dee. Hey, thanks a lot for the session. Um, I'm wondering what you can say about the polls that show there's a low trust in the media and whose fault is it? Is it the fault of these forces that are really trying to undermine uh, journalism as an authoritative source of information? Is it journalism's fault? Is it a combination? Somebody want to take a, take a run of that? Uh, I was reading recently about kind of the unfair penalties we pay for mistakes, um, but I think it's true that, uh, you know, there's a huge penalty for inaccurate reporting, and um, it takes so long to build trust, and it doesn't take that long to lose it. So definitely, I think we have to look inward. Um, it's definitely partially our fault, um, but there are these huge forces, both in politics and 
uh, just in general against what we're trying to do that I think are huge headwinds. Um, so I don't have super good solutions, but that's I think that's who it is to blame. Yeah, I mean, I would say definitely I think it's a it's a both thing, but I think that there, I mean, a lot of people that I talk to when they talk about trust, it's not about not trusting the facts, it's about feeling that they're not respected um, and feeling that they're not represented well. And so I think there's structural issues within journalism that make that worse, um, particularly things around parish journalism. Um, and yeah, I think that there's certainly lots of internal reflexivity that we need <laughs> um, while being mindful that there are people spinning this and using it for, for other means. Both you and Andrea touched on this. The other thing that's tricky when we're talking about these polls and the level of trust in the so-called media is that the media is not this monolithic unit, right? So it's very hard when we're looking at these broad brush statements that people are asked to agree or disagree with to know who they don't trust. Is it the the local outlet that they're that they may or may not be engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it national reporters like myself and Nick who they don't feel like they get a fair shake from? So it's really tricky, but I, I do think it's a both and situation that's kind of gotten us where we are. And I think that as we see technology kind of evolve and access people the access people feel like they have towards media, both local and national, I'll be curious to see how those trends change. I want to come back to something, Andrew, you've a couple of times mentioned parachute journalism as an issue people react to. And, and I always kind of struggle with this. If something happens in Wausau and news outlets in Madison send people to Wausau to cover it, they're parachuting in. Um, I'm not sure what, what the alternative is in some of these cases. What, sure. How do people think about that? I mean, I think there's multiple alternatives. I mean, I think th it's, it's hard to completely ever this. I mean, the same thing with the foreign correspondence model, but I think it tends to be executed in a way that's flawed and it there could be more done. So I think there could be more done as far as building capacity in a lot of communities and finding ways to have reporters of and from communities, um, ways of collaborating with, with small outlets or even non-professionals um, so that there's more opportunities for people from these to, to share their own perspectives. So and essentially then, to build up a network. So for a Madison yeah. news outlet to build up a network of contacts around the state they could draw yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you are going into a, a community that you are an outsider to, finding ways to make yourself more embedded in there and not just dropping in and out. I think this is something that Washington Post has actually done really well. If you'll notice, they've built up a talent network. So they're able to draw, when they're doing these big national stories, you'll often see this talent network's work reflected. So they have journalists who are of these communities that they're bringing in their perspectives to these bigger national stories they're trying to tell. And I think that's an area where all of us could maybe fo follow suit who don't aren't lucky enough to have bureaus in places across the country to draw from when these events pop up that merit our national coverage. Other questions? So the whole question about uh, parachuting in makes me ask about uh, two phenomena. One is so many uh, local media, local newspapers are owned by powerful people who are part of the establishment and they suppress stories on whether it's you know coal miner safety or environmental problems or uh, sanitary problems in chicken plants. And it takes national reporters to go in and uncover that. And I'm thinking the most recent example is the case of Roy Moore, where it was a widespread knowledge about his alleged sexual abuse, got no national coverage, till the Washington Post went in, parachuted, story came out, and if it weren't for them, the story would have never gone anywhere. So how do you explain that phenomenon without national reporters going into these places asking the tough questions that so often local media do not ask. I, I definitely wouldn't want to say that it's never a good thing to have outside reporters coming in. I think there's local power dynamics that you point out and that can certainly prevent stories from coming up and sometimes having that outsider perspective and having the distance that, that and the safety that that outsider might have can be incredibly valuable. I just think that it shouldn't always be the default. I think that there's room for both and that both are valuable, but that the, we haven't always structurally emphasized the one as much as the other. Great. Katie, 
Uh, so, um, Nick and Juana, I have a question specifically about uh, people like me. So, did your educations do enough to prepare you for this kind of thing, for responding? Is, are there things that we should have done differently to sort of get you acquainted with the world of blowback that you were going to get and how to respond to it? I think I had my fair share of uh, experience <laughs> here uh, working at the student papers and, and uh, stepping in it, as it were. And uh, I mean, I think if you make the campus community mad at you and you have to respond to their criticism, it's the same as a local community audience and it's the same as the national audience. So I, I mean, I think I, there was enough of that. I think the question of being prepared to jump into a really complex environment and try to explain it with sensitivity is something that just takes a lot of time to develop. Um, I, I did a story last year where I ended up in North Carolina for a week with a really um, poor community that I, I didn't know much about. I had to try to break through into the faith community to have them tell me about this family, and it was it was really hard, and I had never done anything like it. Um, and that was a true parachute. I, mean, I flew there on a, on a day's notice and, and started to work, and it took me a long time to get my feet under me, um, and I had never done anything like that. So I think any experience for students or, or early career people to do that um, will prepare them to not make the mistakes that we talk about help, you know, move trust. Yeah, um, I think one of the best things, I, and as Phil mentioned, I went to the University of Missouri School of Journalism, is that we were forced as part of our education to work in professional newsrooms and to get out of the classroom and to spend time in community. I mean, most of my work at Mizzou was focused on politics, so I was at the State House on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with state lawmakers on a case-by-case -case basis, or on a day-by-day -day basis. One of the things that I think is different, though, is just the environment is this, particularly in terms of social media and the access that readers and audience have to us is just so different now than it was when I graduated, and I think that the way that I handle when I get blowback from stories or negative feedback has changed a lot. And I, I don't know how you necessarily teach that in an academic context, but I do think as much time as you can spend getting out, getting students out into unfamiliar places, engaging with people who read or can otherwise consume their work can only be a real benefit. I guess I, I would just tag on to that. I think, you know, what, what happens at the Center for Journalism Ethics, and I suspect it happens with professors you've had at Mizzou, to have those contacts, you can call and say, help me think about this. Um, and I know, Katie, you get a lot of those calls, um, but I think that's creating an atmosphere where we can we can talk to each other about, I'm struggling with this, what do I do? I'm really getting creamed from this story I did. Help me walk my way through it. Other questions? Um, yeah. I, I got the mic, so I get Go the for it, then. <laughs> um, Owen? My TA, my yeah. reporting TA over there, uh, did not identify himself as with USA Today, correct? All right. Um, I am not with USA Today, but I am with the Crawford County Independent, which is owned by a chain called Morris Multimedia, whatever they call themselves these days. Um, and it's the largest privately owned a chain of of n newspapers in the country. Privately owned is the, the, the key there. Um, so they own th hundreds, not thousands, hundreds of, of news outlets, including a few TV stations and radio stations and shoppers and a lot of weeklies and a couple of dailies. All right, so they took over the paper that I work for. They bought six papers and they now have nine in southwestern Wisconsin, um, like in 2003. And I'd been working there for with them, with that paper for five years or something. And I thought, oh, wow, you know. They came in, and I'm like, I'm not going to work for these people in, you know, a year. This is it. You know, I, they're going to say things to me and do things to me and you know, probably not going to work here anymore. It was owned by a local owner of six papers, you know. But, Owen, that didn't happen. They have never told me what to report, what not to report. They have no, they're interested in the circulation. They're interested in the advertising. And they're interested in the money. 
So you're making the case that it's possible, even with, with corporate I, I, ownership, to have some independence. Absolutely. And to my amazement, in opposition to my mentor over here, I just had to say that. Great. I saw a question over on this side of the room, which we haven't gotten to this side of the room much, so. All right, they handed me the mic. Okay. Um, we're not picking on Owen, honest. And this may be a little preview of the last panel, but Michelle Holmes of the Alabama Media Group is sitting at the table near the door, and her team's covered the Roy Moore story in depth locally before the national media caught on. And I wonder if you could run this microphone over to her to talk about what it was like to be the local paper of record or local online of record when the story began to be picked up by the national media. Run. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jill. So certainly, um, we had been covering more, very more for many, many, many years. But we did not know these allegations. Uh, we could not prove these allegations against these women. They'd been general things going back for decades. But look, there are general things going back against many male politicians. And this moment in time, this Me Too mo mo moment that, that suddenly makes that a reportable topic is it, hugely contributed. Um, we're really grateful for the Washington Post. Um, our longtime columnist won a Pulitzer this year, as well as the Washington Post, both, both touching on this topic. Um, we couldn't get that story. We didn't get that story although we had been covering Roy Moore as uh, abuse in, as, in the human rights realm uh, for many decades. So I think there is room for national and there is room for local and there are times when people have predisposed ideas about who we are and what we'll cover. And you know, I'm, I'm thrilled at what the Washington Post did. It, it broke open a whole bunch for us, but I think it's Maybe I, I am, of course, glad to get a short opportunity to just say this isn't because we didn't care about this, uh, and this isn't because this wasn't on our radar. But there are times when you know different media sources has, have different sort of roles to play, and and so I think it's good for America, certainly good for Alabama. Um, what happened with the Post? Thanks, thanks so much for that. So um, now we can. Someone was over here. They vanished. Other questions? We can take one or two more, and then we then you get a break, so we don't want this to go on too long here. Anything else that we that you want to ask before we depart? Okay, let's. Um, we get about fifteen minutes, if I understand the can't, the schedule here. Um, thanks so much to Nick, to Andrea, to Juana for being here. Juana, especially in the midst of she's right <laughs> the, working on stories as we're sitting here, so it's very cool. <laughs> thanks so much.